Let me unmute. Good morning. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. It's great to see everyone here this morning. Uh, those of you who have been here um, many, many times before, those of you who may be visiting with us for the first time, um, we start with that little liturgy, which is often part of a, a Eucharistic or a communion liturgy, actually, but it's a very old liturgy and helps connect us to the history of the church. And it's also our way of saying that it is truly our hope and our desire that um, the Lord is with you and encountering you this morning so that you leave here somehow changed by your experience with God. So welcome. Uh, as we get started, um, just a reminder that uh, Sonoma County has you know, changed their mask mandate, so we're going to be following that as best we can. For those of us who will be speaking up front, we're, we're a ways away from you, so if it's all right with everyone, um, it's much easier to, um, uh, to do this unmasked, if that's okay with folks. Um, thanks for your patience. Um, you know, uh, the Delta virus uh, variant has really sort of impacted churches. Um, and so we're just, we're taking it week by week and see, see what happens. Uh, a few announcements first, um, uh, actually just a couple announcements. Um, Tammy Fotley, who many of you know, um, she passed away this week at the age of 98. Um, Tammy was a member of this congregation for a long time, um, mostly before I got here. Uh, and uh, so we are looking at possibly having a service for her on this Friday evening. We don't have any details about that yet, but um, watch uh, for that. We'll send out an exchange announcement and get it, uh, get that information to you. The family would like to do something Friday. Um, I know many of you know Tammy from way back in the day. Um, and uh, so if you'd like to come and celebrate her very long life, everyone is welcome uh, whenever that is going to happen. Uh, also, the veggie table is out this morning. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, one of our really cool ministries is we have a garden back here that, that Jack uh, is in charge of. He's our master gardener, um, and he has a crew of people that keeps that going. And, and the produce that comes from this garden and from your gardens at home also, if you want to bring things in, uh, we put those on our veggie table. And if you'd like to pick up some vegetables to take home, throw in a donation, we'd appreciate it. The proceeds from that go to sustaining the garden, uh, which is also part of our creation care, but also goes towards um, local food ministries. And that's one way of us helping out our local community. Uh, with that being said, um, Homer's gonna be leading us in worship this morning. And so Homer, I'd like to invite you up at this time. This is almost a ritual, isn't it? Uh, uh, <clears throat> we'll now have the lighting of the candles both here and at homes. We light these candles to remind ourselves of God's presence, not only in this place, but in all places. Amen. And uh, I will be uh, giving the response uh, to the various readings, as well as uh, giving the readings uh, during this. Call to worship. We gather to worship our God, who speaks the words of peace we need in chaotic times. We gather to follow Jesus, who encourages us to never fear, for he is near. We gather to be filled with the Spirit who anoints us so that we can go on to serve our world. Prayer and silent listening to God. Let us pray. Son of God, you walk on the waters of turmoil to meet us in the midst of your proposed journey for our lives, your purposed journey for our lives. In our worship this morning, help us to recognize your presence, remember your promise, rely on your power, and receive your peace through the storm. In this time of silence, prepare our hearts for worship. Thank you. 
confession and pardon. When your soul is suffering in silence, call out to the Lord our God, who heals our brokenness, who lifts us up from stormy seas and restores our lives. Let us confess our sin. Lord God, in the light of your glory, we see the evil we have done, the suffering we have caused, the good we have refused, and the truth we have denied. Heal us of our sin, wash us in your mercy, and feed us with your grace so that we may follow your way and tell the good news of the gospel. And now silence the time for personal confession. Rise up from the depths, cast off the shroud of sorrow, and put on the joy of the Lord. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Once again, we want to give um, our thanks to God for the tithes and offerings that we have received this week. So let us pray. God, we again just say thank you for your generosity to us. We acknowledge that every good and perfect gift comes from you. And so uh, for the tithes and offerings we have received this week, we thank you for blessing us first so that we could give back. Not only that we could give back, but that our tithes and offerings, the resources we share would bless others in our world that they might know your provision. So for all of this, we give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. We have two readings uh, this morning, uh, uh, one from the Old Testament and one from the New. And they both deal with how we really don't understand the presence and the power of, of God. From the Old Testament, we have Job 9, verses 4 to 11. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who hath hardened himself against him? and hath prospered, which removeth the mountains, and they know not, which overturneth them in his anger, which shaketh the earth out of her place, and the pillars thereof tremble, which commandeth the sun, and it riseth not, and sealeth up the stars, which alone spreadeth out the heavens, and treadeth upon the waves of the sea, which maketh Arturus Orion, Orion and Pleiades and the chambers of the south, which doeth great things past finding out, yea, and wonders without number. Lo, he goeth by me, and I see him not. He passeth on also, but I perceive him not. And then the gospel is Mark 6, verses 45 to 52. And straightway he constrained his disciple to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. 
And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and, and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up unto them un, into the ship, and the wind ceased. And they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered, for they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hey, Lidra. I spotted you wandering in. It's good to see you. It's good to see all of you. Those of you here in the sanctuary and, and those of you um, at home, um, I love that we've been able to continue to be church through this season and that we've been able to do it in different ways. And we've been learning how, you know, what church is all about. So it's really, really good to be here uh, once again. So let's start with a story recap. Um, Jesus and his disciples, they've just been with 5,000 people out in the desert. And the disciples are like, hey, it's going to be dinner. These people are hungry. What do we do? There's no Whole Foods nearby or Safeway, not even 7-Eleven. Jesus says, you feed them. So they do. Everyone gets fed. And right after that, uh, Jesus tells them, hey, um, you disciples get in that boat and take off. And so they push off the shore. Uh, it's close to dark, obviously, because it's, you know, after dinner. And my first question is like, why sail at night if you don't have to, especially on the Sea of Galilee? It doesn't seem wise, but okay, Jesus says so. And so they're rowing and they're rowing and they're rowing and they get out uh, a ways. And um, uh, this wind kicks in right so have you ever been in a boat and you've been rowing against the wind what happens you don't go nowhere so they're just rowing in place they're doing exactly though what they know to do anybody who's you know been a fisherman or farmer or knows the sea you just keep rowing and it's just getting them nowhere even though it worked in the past it ain't working right now and so Jesus comes to them, but he kind of comes to them, but he kind of doesn't because he's walking out to them. But did you catch that line about how he's like, he's going to pass them by? There's your Job connection, right? I love that Mark draws from this little image in Job about God passing them by. And so here's Jesus passing them by, which is Mark's way of saying this guy, Jesus, is God. So he's going to pass them by. Um, but what they do, they look out, they see this figure on the water, and what do they do? They're not like, hey, Jesus, hey, over here, they totally freak out, which gets Jesus' attention. He stops, he approaches them, he reassures them, hey, you guys, it's me, don't be afraid, and then he climbs into the boat with them, and then what happens? Right away, the wind stops, uh, but still, did you catch that part about their hearts are still hardened? And so they don't really understand what's going on with this Jesus guy. Even though they just seen this feed, miraculous feeding of 5,000 and Jesus walking on the water, they're still not quite sure. Here's one thing I wanna point out, and maybe you picked this up in the story as well. These, disciples in the boat are not afraid of the sea and they're not afraid of the wind they're used to that did you pick up that they're actually afraid of this mysterious figure on the water that they think is a ghost now the rowing is hard work 
um, and they don't mind a few blisters, right? They're just gonna keep doing it. They're gonna keep doing it, that's fine. Um, but they get terrified only when they see Jesus on the water. So the storm isn't really the problem. The problem here is Jesus in the story for them. Now, sailors can be superstitious um, or maybe just highly um, respectful of the ocean. If you have ever watched any like deadliest catch or anything like that, you know, sailors have particular or, or crab fishermen have particular rituals sometimes that what, before they go out on the sea, particular words you don't say or things you do say before you go. Um, and so, uh, especially if you're going out at night, right? This is a, a different kind of sailing, being out on the water. So Jesus comes to them in the fourth watch of the night. And so this particular time is just before dawn when all the funny stuff starts happening. It's when everyone is still asleep and it's just you out there on watch, surrounded by all the black water as far as you can see, especially if there's no moon, then it's really dark and your eyes, they start to maybe play tricks on you and you, you stare at the waves long enough that um, you start to think maybe you see land out there or maybe you see something worse. What was that shadow that just appeared over the surface of the water? You think maybe you see rocks rising up that your boat is gonna crash into and sink. Or maybe it's a phantom ship out on the horizon that's just drifting with all of its lights off and its tattered sails blowing in the wind. Maybe it's even a sea monster. And pretty soon the waves, they start to sound like like people whispering or like the breathing of some huge invisible being. And if you've ever been out in a very dark place like this, it can be very lonely feeling. And you're a long, long way from home. Just picture yourself out in the middle of the sea. You can't see any land around you. It's silent except for the whispers of the sea. And you realize, there are a lot of ways that I could die out here. It all starts to play tricks on your mind. So what do you do? Well, if you're familiar with being in a boat on the water, you, you row and you row and you row and you row and you stay busy rowing. You're just rowing as hard as you can, staying focused on whatever distant shore you think is out there on your, your destination that you're working towards. And you ignore, ignore everything that gets in your way. And these poor, hard-hearted disciples, they, they can't really see Jesus. And they're, you know, they're just doing what they've always done, what's familiar to them, what's safe, what their daddy taught them about how to get across the lake. You just put your head down and you start rowing. You know, just, just, just do that thing. Just do it more. You no, know, the wind's blowing, just do it harder. Try harder. That's what they're prepared for. They're prepared for harsh winds at sea. That's not totally unheard of. This is what they do. What they're not prepared for, what they're not prepared for is to look out there in the fourth watch and see their Lord, Jesus, hiking toward them across the Sea of Galilee, walking on top of the water. I just want to be like totally real about this. If that was me in the boat, I would absolutely freak out. Legia, if you came walking towards me on, in the middle of a lake on the water, I, I would freak out. Yeah. This was not what they expected. Then they didn't expect this at all. It doesn't fit into any of their preconceived categories of how the world works. Jesus is walking on the water and it doesn't fit their expectations at all. He is not supposed to be there. Not at all. It was like it would be like if I looked up and Leader, you're floating in the rafters. You are not supposed to be there. 
Don't even try it. So they didn't see him because they're not looking for him because they're not expecting to see him out there. They see a ghost. That's what they're seeing. They think they're seeing a ghost and they're so focused on their duties, you know, on, they're on guard against all the things that go bump in the night when you're out in a boat at night with the wind blowing. They're so focused on their duties of rowing that um, they mistake him for a spook, a ghost, uh, a phantom, for someone or something that is heading towards them and means to harm them. And maybe he would have passed them by, except for that they cry out, again, not because of the storm, but because there's this ghost walking towards them. It reminds me of an old Scooby-Doo sort of episode, right? But the hood is still on the guy in the sea and eventually they'll take it off and it won't be the, the bad guy. It's gonna be Jesus. But they don't know that. Jesus hears their cry, and then he decides, okay, I'm going to go towards them. He says, hey, take heart, everybody. It's me. Uh, don't be afraid. Everything's cool. Their hearts are still kind of hard. Um, they don't still don't totally understand. Um, even though their hearts are hardened maybe towards him and what he's doing, he still accepts them and climbs into the boat. And when he gets in the boat, what happens? The wind immediately stops. Uh, they, they can stop rowing, or at least they can just do some simple, easy paddling. When they stop working so hard at the oars, that gives them a little bit more time to just sit back and breathe and to, have, to talk, to, to rest a little bit. I imagine them laughing, talking about, what a crazy day, right? What went on back there with all those 5,000 people? What just happened with Jesus who just climbed in the boat? Where they don't have their head down working, working, working themselves to the bone, it frees up more time to be a community together. The other thing I noticed about this story is it takes place in the middle of the, the uh, Sea of Galilee. Um, one thing about Jesus that you should know is Jesus spent more time outside of the sanctuaries and the, um, the synagogues than he did inside. If you read through the gospels, most of the time he's out in people's homes, he's out in the middle of a field, um, he's just out, out and about. And so they encounter Jesus in a place not confined by four walls and a steeple. Sometimes it feels like we in the church are in the fourth watch of the church. Um, so what we tend to do when things seem scary or uncertain is we just start rowing harder, right? We do the stuff that is familiar to us, that has always worked in the past, the stuff that's easy because we know how to do it, and not the stuff that's risky because, well, it's risky and we don't know if it'll work. But do you ever feel like even in church, you, we are rowing and rowing and rowing against the wind and going absolutely nowhere? That's discouraging, that's hard, that's frustrating. So we're rowing, we're going nowhere, What's the next thing we do? We say, we got to row harder. And so we start rowing harder and harder. And why do we row harder? I think it's, I wonder, I wonder if it's because maybe we have just grown to not expect that Jesus is going to show up, even in church. Like, he's out there. Maybe we're even afraid that if Jesus shows up, something might happen and we're not sure we want that to happen because that might be scary for us or unfamiliar. So we, we create this sense that it's all up to us. We got this down, we're at the oars, we know what happened in the past when we rode, everything worked out, but we're still going nowhere. <sighs> but here's the thing, God was in the story with the disciples in the boat that night 
They just weren't expecting or looking for him. And so what I want to remind us of this morning is that um, this is not our story. We often think the story of the church is our story and what we do and all how hard we try, all the events we host and all the small groups and all that. And we start saying, saying, this is my church. But the truth is, it's God's church and that God is in every story because this is God's story. It's not his story, story or her story. It's God's story. And so God is in every person's life, every church's story, every nation's story, every hospital room, every classroom or cafe, every every dining room, every bedroom, every office space and field and forest, God is in all of those places. You know how we got off track with some of this? With a bumper sticker. How many of you seen this bumper sticker? God is my co-pilot. Yeah? No judgment if any of you have had this bumper sticker, but it's terrible theology. And what? No judgment. No judgment. <laughs> says the other Presbyterian minister in the room. Can somebody tell me why this is terrible theology? Yeah. It makes us the pilot. And, and God's playing shotgun to us. How's that for bad theology? God is always the pilot, steering the world in the direction that God wants to go, steering the church in the direction God wants it to go. And so I wonder if we ought to just stop trying so hard to steer the boat and row the boat and do everything that we can to try to fix whatever we think we need to fix. And maybe we just need to start paying more attention and ask, where is God already doing stuff? What is God up to already? And how do we get on board with that? How do we cultivate our ability to recognize Jesus in the world, especially in places where maybe we have given up expecting that he'll show up at all. Well, if he's in all places at all times, then that changes our perspective because it means that God is present in the most mundane moments of life. First of all, we don't invite God here on Sunday morning because we just know and assume God is already here long before we showed up. But God shows up in these mundane moments like sitting at a bus stop talking to a stranger I was crossing the street this week, uh, crossing Pelham Boulevard, and this total stranger, this guy walking next to me, just starts talking to me about the traffic in Petaluma. We just had a nice little conversation. It lasted how many steps to cross the street, but we learned how many years we'd lived in Petaluma, each of us, where we lived, what we do for work, all in the span of crossing Petaluma Boulevard. I think God was in that moment. It might be God being there in a, when you're pouring tea that you're sharing with a friend or in a thank you that you give to your postal carrier. But God is also present in the car when you're driving uh, your child to the hospital because he's just fallen off his skateboard and broken his arm. It's in the walk out to the car after just having lost your job. God is present uh, in the doctor's office when you get the diagnosis that you've been afraid, terrified to get. God is present in the, the sadness and the messiness of your divorce. Or when your granddaughter is crying after taking a hard spill on her bike. God's there. So the question isn't, the question isn't, is God here wherever you are in the world or in this church? The question is, where and how is God here? And am I, am I actually looking for what God is doing? Of course, you're going to ask, how do we know if God's there or not? Uh, I'll just say, if there's kindness and goodness, compassion, peacefulness, healing, inclusion, reconciliation, patience, love, forgiveness, God is there. 
And it, if it is painful and hard, if there is betrayal, uh, abuse, illness, disunity, suffering, injustice, and violence, well, God is there too. Maybe still on the water, maybe hidden from what our we're able to perceive with our eyes, but if God is everywhere, God's in the good and the bad. And is that something we practice? The presence of practice, the presence of God, as Brother Lawrence described it. Jesus knows our pain. He weeps with us, suffers with us. He knows pain and that feeling of abandonment, abandoned by his disciples, beaten by the authorities, mocked and ridiculed, and finally killed. And so the question is, well, was God there too? That was pretty awful. And the answer is, yeah, God was there too. God's always present, always doing something, but often that something is a mystery. And that's okay because this too is God's story. Here in the church, we're really good at rowing. So good at rowing. We stick to what we know, we stick to what is familiar and easy, and oftentimes in the church, it's all that stuff that worked really great in 1983. We just try harder, even though it might not be working. And so my question to you is how many of you are tired of rowing and rowing and rowing harder and harder Tired of feeling like no matter how hard you row, no matter how many things you volunteer for, we're going nowhere. I know a lot of church folks who feel exhausted. So here's what I want to say to you this morning. Stop rowing so hard. What if we took a break from all the rowing with what we do? And we lifted our eyes and we started to pay more attention to what God in Christ is already doing. Where is God already? Maybe those are familiar places. Maybe those are unexpected places in the mundane places while weeding the garden. I think God is always present in the garden, Jack. Always. Always, 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 always. God's in line at the grocery store, wiping snot off a child's face or applesauce or whatever else. You know, in my house, it was like, when you're pulling a pea out of my brother's nose. God's in that also. Jesus mostly ministered outside of the synagogue while walking with friends, eating with strangers at a dinner table, picnicking in the desert, preaching on a hillside, or out, out on the water. You don't stop being church when you leave this place. If you are only being church for one hour a week while you're in these walls, something is wrong with the way we're doing church. Jesus is not going to be confined to this place. I'm pretty sure you'd rather be out there anyway. And so here's my charge to you this morning. I want you to continually be asking and answering this question. Where did you see God this week? in your daily life? And how can you partner with God in what God is already doing? Assume that God is already doing something. That's the Christian story. I, was, I pulled up to the, the stoplight on Lakeville and D Street this week on my way to work, and I noticed out of the corner of my eye somebody was waving. I looked over and it was Kayla, little Kayla is driving, right? God was right there in that moment because that just, that was just such a great thing to experience. And then a few hours later, I met Mike Glose for coffee down at the Petaluma Coffee and Tea Company. And just as we're showing up, guess who's coming out? Kayla with her friend. God showed up twice to me through Kayla, little Kayla who's driving and starting college. Now, you could just say that was just a coincidence, but I prefer to think that God was in that. I saw God in the olive trees 
outside, uh, olive tree outside my window at work, at home, my office window where the birds were just playing. I saw God on D Street on my way home when there was a homeless woman trying to cross the street, not at a crosswalk, but right, right in front of Walnut Park there. You know, there's a lot of traffic. And I saw all the cars stop for her. Everyone. I saw God in that moment. So my charge to you is keep your eyes open this week. Little things, it doesn't have to be a big thing. It could be as little as, I ran out of soap for my dishes and I didn't know what to do. And I looked in the garage and I found a full bottle. Praise be to God. Little things, little things. It may be the fourth watch for the church, but that's all the more reason to keep watching for and expecting Jesus. The Christian life is about expectation, expecting to encounter God and having that change us. Jesus likes to show up in the most unexpected places, even church on Sunday morning. You have your assignment. You have your assignment. Maybe we'll check in next week to see where you saw God. Amen. Hey, hi, you guys. I, I, there you are. I was unmuted. I was muted, right? Yeah, we're going to pray now. First, we'll start with the sanctuary folks. And then um, we'll, we'll hear from you all at home. Uh, so God, here we are in prayer. Uh, you know our needs, but we want to speak them out loud. You know our thanksgivings, but we want to speak them out loud as well. So people of God, uh, those of you in the sanctuary, I invite you to pray your prayers of thanksgiving and petition out loud at this time. Lord, hear our prayers.
Roger um, has a prayer of thanksgiving for Marin's grandson. There was a COVID scare, right? And he's he's okay. On the mend, on the mend. Lord, in your mercy. For firefighters and first responders, we pray, Lord, in your mercy. For the end of the pandemic, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Say that again, Mike, until then. Until then, we pray for the wisdom and instruction of doctors and nurses and uh, health professionals um, to uh, talk with those who may be vaccine hesitant and encourage them to do what's best for their family. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Prayer for the people of Afghanistan, uh, whose future is really uncertain and unstable right now. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Prayers for teachers and students preparing to go back to school or who are already in school. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Now let's hear from you folks at home. Um, you'll be on the screen here. So if you have a prayer you'd like to speak out loud, feel free to, otherwise you could type it in the chat box on your screen. Phoebe writes, for all fire victims, especially for my friend Roger's sister who lost her home in the Greenville, in Greenville this week. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Prayers of thanksgiving for the wonderful gathering that the music ministry had yesterday, the feeling of getting back together. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Here at First Presbyterian Church, we pray the Lord's Prayer every Sunday. Um, and it's, it's our way of acknowledging that God is, this is God's story and God's kingdom is being made manifest in this world and we get to play a part in it. And we pray it almost prophetically, like this is the future that we are working towards. And so I invite you once again, people of God, to join in uh, with the Lord's Prayer as we always uh, do. I invite you to in Pray whatever version is most familiar to you and whatever language is most comfortable to you. We pray together now saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
I've already given you your charge for the week, um, but I'd like to invite you to stand um, as we as we wrap up here, as we close, just as a reminder, your charge this week is to pay attention. Where is God already in your world, in your life? It doesn't have to be a big thing. It doesn't have to be a big thing. But this practice of recognizing and seeing God in the world reorients our lives. So maybe next week we'll check in and see where you saw God this week. Receive now the blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Go in peace. Happy Sunday, everybody. Sunday to you, Jane. Thank you, senior dear. Thank you.